Is everything in here yours or is it? You'll see. Welcome to Megaphonics 2023 and welcome to Frank Cassidy's home basically. So we're here, it's much busier than it was when we shot this interview, but this is my conversation with Frank. Um, what is there to talk about with Frank now? I mean, he's been, I think everybody in the culture and the industry in Porsche knows him now, um, either from his collection and what collection it is, but also actually, because he's done some interviews before. However, Frank and I sit down and have a really intimate conversation about his history, his past, uh, where he's come from and how he ended up with this collection. Um, so stay tuned and here is Frank Cassidy and me, Paul from Engineering, talking about his life, his cars and Porsche culture. Anyway, right, so if it's all right with you, can we, we've done a bit about me, can we start from very young Frank? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, for me, Getting into cars was birth, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So apparently, again, I, I hear from my old man that he, I wouldn't sleep unless he chucked me in the back of his MG BGT <laughs> and then took me for a drive and I fell for asleep. What, in the back of what car? An MG BGT. Okay, yeah. Or Triumph Spitfire, one of the two, but mm -hmm. um, like 70s crappy kind of sports cars. But yeah, so what's, what, where, where did it start for you? Is it that early or was it a bit later or? Yeah, so mum says, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to correct her because it's, cause it's, it sounds good to me. Yeah. Um, well, mum tells me that apparently my first word was vroom. Really? <laughs> apparently so. <laughs> right. Apparently so. I just watch cars go down, you know, the road through a window or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, so apparently that was my first word. And then whenever she used to take me to the park, um, she'd have to strap me into a pushchair, even though the park was about five minutes walk away. Um, because otherwise I'd stop at every single car on the way down to right. the, um, to the, to the park. So I, I, you know, I don't know what that is. It gets to a point where you start thinking, okay, well, how much of it is nurturing? How much of it is nature? Yeah. I don't know. So maybe there's something intrinsically in me that was like, oh, I like the shape of that. And I like yeah. the sound of that. Um, cause it's multi-sensory, <laughs> isn't it? And as a kid, that's, I mean, uh, this is, I'm just thinking off the fly, but smells, sights, mm. sounds, it's all there pretty mm. much. Yeah. So I wonder if it's that is as a kid. I don't know. But all interestingly, um, interestingly enough, like um, my my dad um, was uh, worked for um, for a big car brand. Um, I don't know the full details. That sounds really weird. Basically, what it is is that um, my birth father. I was adopted at birth. I found maybe what was it two three years ago now. And um, yeah, it transpired that he was a car guy. He's a massive car guy. He's massively into German cars. Right. And actually, he was he was working for an American car brand um, on the border of Mexico and Texas. Um, so uh, so yeah. So I don't know. I guess it's in my nature. Is what I'm getting at. Yeah. So that's so. Where did it, so where did Porsche come in then? Was it Porsche came in from my adoptive father? Okay. So the. Um, so my dad had, well, no, so my mum bought me The Love Bug, a 1967 film, you know, yeah, about yeah, the Volkswagen yeah. Beetle, and yeah. I fell in love with that. I don't know what the sound, the shape of it, whatever it was. So I, I got really into that. And then my dad bought in 1983, I guess it must have been, a, um, yeah, a, uh, a Targa. Okay. Um, guards red, black leather interior. Um, and uh, Just and out of curiosity. That a, cemented it for me. A, has he still got that car? Yeah. 
And have you got a, an 83 Targa? No, I don't. So the, he, doesn't, he hasn't got that car. He sold it to a friend who took it to France and who had it in France for many years. And then when his friend wanted to buy it back, um, we bought it back, or my dad bought it back. Wow, that's cool. And then he had it for, I don't know, 10 years or something of the sort. And then in his infinite wisdom, he decided to sell it. And he sold it for five grand. I mean, that's what they were worth <laughs> at the time. He sold it for fuck all. And this, this is like the genesis of, of my obsession with Porsche. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You know, I love my dad, but there's a part of me that does, that does dislike him for having sold that piece of my heart, I guess. Um, and then it was sold to someone else who still has it till this day because I managed to track it down. I think it was about five, six years ago. Right. But he's got no interest in selling it. Really? But like, it's exactly as I remember it. Wow. And it's, um, it's, it's still... Yeah, I think he's had it repainted since. He's rebuilt the gearbox. Apparently that blew up shortly after he bought it off my dad. Um, and, uh, is he and repainted yeah. Guards Red still? Is he yeah, just... still Guards oh, Red. Well, still something. on the cookie, on, still, no, cookie cutter. Still on the <coughs> Teledar wheels. And um, when I got in touch with him, he said to me, do you know why the dashboard is all, is all scratched? Um, the, top, the top part of the, um, uh, what do you call it? The dashboard over, you know, the bit that goes over the gauges. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I said, yeah, 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 absolutely. It's because my mum used to drive around with big rings because she used to drive us around in that car, actually, when we were kids. She had baby seats in the back. She yeah. used to take a school in that car. And so she had big rings. And so when she was driving the car, she would... I don't know how she did it. They must have been huge because there is still quite a bit of different yeah. part of distance between the string <laughs> yeah. wheel and the thing. Yeah. But um, she, she, yeah, she would brush against the top of the binnacle wow. and as a result destroyed the dash. Now, I wear jewellery. I wear big rings and yeah. I've never had that problem. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know so exactly must know have been how like... she did it. But, uh, but she did. So it's still got those scuffs apparently on the dash. Do you know what though? That's if, the stuff yeah. I would never change. Well, yeah, absolutely. Of course. Like if I yeah. ever got that car back. Uh, you want to preserve that. And if he changed that. it, if he, if he, if he retrimmed the dashboard, yeah. it would break my heart. Yeah. But then again, it's his car, it's, his it's, rules now. Yeah. It's nothing to do with me anymore. Going back to watches though. I mean, that's the same for me. Like, so I've got another watch that I, a, um, a Pepsi, GMT Pepsi, and I'll probably keep that quite nice. This though, this, again, my wedding watch, we were talking about this off camera a minute ago. Every mark, every scratch. There's a dent in it from where we went on honeymoon and I smashed it on the train side of the train door. Mm. But those things don't annoy me at all because mm. that is a part of, you know, you, and I'm sure it's you with that dash, right? If you got that car back, you know, we all move on to other realms or whatever at some point and you're an old guy and you look and your history, your heritage baked into those scratches. On that totally, dashboard. it tells a story. I mean, there's, there's, I don't know, a brand new 911 that's just rolled off the forecourt um, and it's box fresh is a little bit boring to me, yeah. you know, um, whereas a 911 that's got loads of patina and scratches and dents and mismatched color and this and the other yeah. is, is a much more interesting car. It tells a story. It's been yeah. on adventures, you know, um, and I think that's part of the part of the fun of classic older cars. And there's, there's a friend of mine um, called Simon Medlicott. He's a brilliant photographer as well and a uh, Porsche guy. And he's got a, um, a 240 72 car, stunning thing. And it is, it is covered in road rash, the paint's mm -hmm. cracking in all sorts of places. And it just looks absolutely awesome. It just tells the story. It's mad, isn't it? It's better for it. And yet people chase after the, the perfect car. And I, I, to an extent I get, I mean, like, this is what I did with my Cayman, right? So I bought the lowest mileage, cleanest version I could. Mm. 14,000 miles, dry weather car only, with the intention of keeping it forever. And then and a couple of people, there's a few marks here and then, uh, there, but. I, I'm again totally happy with the. Art. I don't want to damage it, like mm. purposefully damage the thing. But if it picks up the odd stone chip here and there, like bring it on. No, it's part of life. That stone chip is an alpine pass. This piece of rubber that's yeah. melted onto the bodywork is from that track day. You know, it's fun. There's um, my Olive ST. I took on three thousand miles across Europe of up and down alpine passes, and it's got stone rash all well, down the sides now. You know, um, and uh, yeah, it just adds to the character. It is what it is. It's a car. You know, yeah, as long as yeah. it's mechanically sound yeah. and it gets me from A to B with a huge grin on my fucking face, then that's all the fucking matters. That's the win. Yeah. I don't really care about, about that. There's a big dent in the bonnet of that car. Really? You know, because I was called, I think one time, like an idiot, I couldn't, for some reason or another, I pressed on too hard on the bonnet and I managed to make a little dent just underneath the uh -huh. badge. But again, it doesn't slow me down. I don't really care. Um, the car still works well. And I guess one day if I ever sell it, then yeah, I'll knock out that dent. Yeah. You know, um, and I'll, I'll probably uh, give the paint a bit of a refresh, but in the meantime, um, it means I don't need to baby it, I don't need to be careful about it. Yeah. And I can just enjoy the car yeah. and focus, you know, focus, um, 
focus the money that I'm going to spend on that car on things which are important, like doing a gearbox rebuild yeah. or doing the really good service and making sure everything mechanically is tip-top condition. Yeah. Because that's the stuff that really matters, yeah. Definitely. Going back to that target then, so, so we've yeah. got to the point where you've kind of got the bug, you've got, you know, literally you've been watching the, the bug on TV and you've got this target that's kind of giving you the goosebumps as you're going in it. There's a step, that, there's a journey between that though and becoming an adult and being in a situation where um, you're in a fortunate enough position to even start collecting cars. But what was the first one? What was the, the first Porsche that you owned at that point? Um, first 911 was a 964. Was seven. it a nine, the first one was 911? Yeah, it was a 964. And it was a, um, it was a seven grand car. Right. Yeah. So back in those days, the 964 was the car that nobody wanted. Which is wild, isn't it, when you look at it today? It is, but to me, it's wild the other way around. Right. You know, I look at 964s now and think, how the hell is that a 1.8 million pound Singer? Yeah. 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 Singer DLS, yeah. which is a phenomenal car. I get it. You know, what's called, I'm, I'm sure it's worth that. The amount of engineering that's gone into it, four mm. per cylinder, all the rest of it is absolutely incredible. Sure. But to me, a 964 nice is an eight grand car. Yeah. You know, to me, it's in my 20s going, I'm going to buy a seven grand, you know, uh, 964. Um, and my dad saying to me that I'm, com I'm a complete idiot, that it's going to be financial suicide. It's going to be financial suicide and that I should buy a reasonably priced hatchback the at the end of it. And he was absolutely yeah. fucking right. I mean, yeah. the car leaked oil like a sieve. Um, I traveled around with about five, with a five liter bottle of oil in the rear, in the rear of it, behind the seat. Um, because everywhere I went, it just, it just leaked so much oil. And you couldn't see out the rear window. So if you were going along the motorway, for example, the oil would come up around the back and it would lie on the top of the rear screen and you just end up with this greasy mess on the rear glass. But it was, it was an absolute mess. But yeah, in those days, that's, that's what they were worth. They were worth nothing. So people weren't spending any money on them? No, them at that no. Point. And so what's interesting about the 964 is that, um, is that it was born in the 90s and the 90s recession. So there weren't that many that were built and mm. sold. Mm. And it was the first year of the four wheel drive. So all the purists hated the car. Right. Because in 89, it was only available in four wheel drive. Was it really? Only, right, yeah. there you go. See, so Heritage, that's like a nugget for me because yeah. I would not have known that. Yeah, so 89 was the, was, in 89, you could only get it as a Carrera 4. It was only until 1990 that they started doing it as a C2. So you had this car that was born in the 90s um, at a time when there was a recession. So many people, not many were bought. On top of that, it was plagued by bad press because all the purists and all the journalists were like, what is this newfangled four-wheel drive system yeah. that's ruining the purity of this car that we're obsessed with? So all the articles for 89 the, when it was launched were, were negative. Plus also, there was no... Um, it used a dual mass flywheel, which had, fa right. which had failures. Yeah. So that didn't help either. And it also didn't have head sealing rings. So it was leaking oil like a sieve anyway from the get-go. So all of a sudden you had all these little elements coming together to give mm. you a recipe for a car that was underappreciated and that would eventually become cheap as chips and that people wouldn't spend money on because it wasn't worth anything. It was, and it also had those huge you know, deformable bumpers as well. Yeah, which everybody yeah. thought was really, really ugly. Um, and actually, it's funny how designs can sometimes age so well and change. Mm. But um, yeah, so, so that car was, I mean, I bought it because it was the only 911 I could afford. Yeah. Um, and there was, there was a whole rabble of us who were, who were buying these 964s um, and modifying them because it didn't really matter because they were high mileage and they weren't necessarily very well looked after mm. anyway. Mm. So you could do it without thinking, without batting an eyelid. And we were also tracking them, you know, and if you slammed wow. it into a wall, it didn't really matter. Yeah. You just call up the scrapyard, Douglas Valley, you know, or, or Porsche part at the time or whatever, and get a new wing bolted on and away you go. It didn't really matter. It was a cheap car. Yeah. You know, it was a bit of a laugh. Um, in the meantime, the brand new 996 was out and that was the Porsche right. that everybody wanted. Right. For me though, I'm, I've never been interested necessarily in new things. I like old things. Mm. I like things that have, have a story to tell, have an interesting history, an, an interesting backstory. Um, and also, I'm a sucker for um, I'm a sucker for good design, and I you can tell that. that. I mean, that 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 is dripping out of this place, right? Oh, that's kind. But yeah, I'm a sucker for design, and and so new designs often enough. I don't think I've had the time to 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 I don't know to to mellow and to really mature. Yeah. And actually, with an older car, it had time. It's had time yeah. to mature and to yeah, mellow. Yeah. So they they. So you can tell what looks good and what doesn't look good. Whereas new designs, often enough, you, you, you can't tell quite yet whether that's going to age well. And you, it's funny you say um, that because, again, if you look at that series of cars up until the 996, you can see there's a gentle iteration. Like the profile is generally the same. The, top, mm. the body's the same. Um, and then 
I think you're right. So 996 onwards, it's, it's almost like how quickly, they're probably working on the 99, whatever it's going to be, 903, it won't be a 903. They say they're four years. It's four all, years. Apparently the motor industry generally is Which about is four crazy, years. Which is crazy, because like you said, it's not, it's not fermenting. It's like that ferment, fermentation per, like process that just yeah. gently bubbles away. And then, you know, somebody kind of discovers something and you can smooth something out or kind of make more of something else. But it's still that gentle iteration, going back to Royal Oaks and Rolex and lots of other brands with watches and stuff. Not a lot changes. But it's the de again again this is off camera but the detail for me is the important bits mm. you move the game on massively and change something so radically it then becomes it's hard to connect right the, the lineage for me mm. for that yeah so i totally 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 get stopping there stopping pre-996 but it's not it's i um it's i but i haven't Okay. I've owned water cooled Porsches. Right, right. I always get pigeon called as an air cooled, a pigeon hold as an air cooled guy. Right. And I get that, and yeah. I deserve it. You know, what's called my cars are air cooled, and, and that's what really sets me on fire. But I have, I have, that doesn't mean that one, I haven't owned water cooled cars, and two, that I don't appreciate them. Sure. So sure. I've owned uh, a 997 Turbo. Okay. Phenomenal car, huge amount of respect, mind bending. I mean, the fact that it can be a daily driver and have that much power is absolutely obscene to me. Right. And 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 it's something that I can only I can only appreciate. I mean, you you can't not appreciate the amount of engineering that goes into making something that's capable of doing that mm. on a daily basis, mm. and that could be driven by your nan. You know, yeah. six hundred horsepower, whatever it is. I don't know how much they are. What are they? Four hundred, five hundred horsepower, something like that. Four fifty. It doesn't matter. The point yeah. is, it's an obscene amount of horsepower to get down the road. Yeah. And your nan could drive it. Yeah. And that the engineering that goes into that is something that I cannot not appreciate. Yeah. So yeah. I appreciate new cars and the engineering that goes into them hugely, massively so. And I, I love my nine hundred seven turbo. I mean it was a Swiss army knife. Yeah. You know, most cars are good at doing one thing or another. I mean the nine eleven, generally speaking, throughout all its generations, but especially the new ones, mm. are capable of doing everything. A roads, B roads, motorways and everything else in between. You know, four seats, a huge amount of luggage space once you put the rear seats down. I mean, they're just, they're just phenomenal cars. So I appreciate, so I, I do appreciate water cool cars. We've had a KN yeah. that was a fantastic car as well. Right, okay. We've had a, an early, what was it? I think it was a Gen 1 or a Gen 2, I forget. No, it must have been Gen 1. It was a Gen 1 GTS. Um, and uh, and that, was, that was an absolutely brilliant car. So yeah, I do appreciate mm. modern, modern metal too. I'm, I'm going to stick to my... Um stick to my thread, I think, and kind of live in that for a sec. I, it's not that I don't appreciate water cooled stuff. I do. I appreciate what it can do. But everything, and it's probably why I bought a base Cayman and I wasn't particularly bothered about speed for mm. me or anything like that. It was, it was it's, everything's about emotion for me. So, what creates emotion? And I find it, and it's part of the reason why I sold my Carrera T that I was talking to you about earlier on. It didn't generate the same feelings for me. Mm. And, and I chase that. I don't chase what the, what the, a Nürburgring lap time is. I don't chase how quick something is at the top end. I'm not bothered at all. I don't care. I need to be, I need to want to get up in the morning and go and drive it or just go and sit in the garage with it or, and, and whatever it does, if they, if Porsche creates something that new that does that, fine. Hmm. So far, I find it difficult, more difficult to access that emotionally than I do older stuff. Yeah. So that, that's, again, that's just a, it's not a criticism of those cars. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a completely personal thing no, to sure. me, which is why, my, weirdly, the 981 Cayman is... So when I was going through, like, kind of, what shall I buy? Because I came out of a, a really heavily modified Lotus Elise. Um, and, it, and I was trying to work out, I wanted a Cayman R. I was kind of looking at that as... 911s, yeah, great. But if I was going to buy a 911, it, I really wanted an air-cooled car. And it was just beyond budget. Um, I wanted something small. I didn't want, and I felt like nine and even 997.1 onwards, less so 996, but that kind of era. And I was then I was looking at, I don't want a comp heavily compromised car that I'm going to have to spend 15 grand at Hartec mm. on in six months. Yeah. I didn't want that. Mm. Um, so that kind of left me with Cayman for mm. size, 987.2 or 981, 718 uh, at that point didn't have the four liter GTS. So it's kind of like, I don't want a four cylinder car. I want that six cylinder thing. I want that. Um, I wanted something special or special to me. And then I was like, well, what can I get for the apps? What's the best version of this car in the best? And I'll try and be as flexible as I can on most things. I really wanted a basic Porsche iconic color. Mm. 
So it would have been guards red or white or, you know, or black or something that was kind of like real bare, paired it back, bare bones, Porsche mm. color. And I ended up stumbling on that kind of 981. I was like, well, that's it. The spec's perfect. It's got hardly any miles. I can kind of, I'll do more miles on it very quickly. And it suddenly become completely right. my car. Yeah. Um, but then I was trying to, and this is the point I was trying to get to, is that I kind of went off that idea probably about two or three years in because it was PCP, so I couldn't do anything to it. It was like, mm. not my car. Mm. Um, bought this Carrera T thinking, well, it's like, it's a 911. It's quite low run in terms of how many they've made. Mm. You know, I like something that, that, that's kind of, there's fewer about, you know, even if people said it was marketing exercise. And realized really quickly that everything I wanted originally, small, relatively lightweight, or that's not, um, if you, if you park a 981 or a 987 next to a 964 or something, they're not the same, but you can kind of see that the size is sort of similar. Yeah, I, I, I totally get that. I think I agree with you. I think if, if the day comes that I buy a, a new, a new Porsche product, a new Porsche product, and it will, you know, um, that I do it again, I will of course dip toes again in, in newer stuff. I think, I, I think there's a real sweet spot with the Caymans. Yeah. Mm. I think there's, there's a nice size to them. You know, the, the, the reality is that what's called, I, I, I boil it down to how do I use the car? Yeah. And that defines everything for me. Okay, cool. So th the thing that I enjoy the most is Alpine touring. Right. So what does that mean? That means it needs to be able to get me from the UK in relative comfort to a degree to the Alps. Yeah. And then be raucous when I'm out there and perfect for the job. Now, right. the bigger the car on an Alpine pass, the bigger the problems. Yeah, yeah. Um, you need yeah, something that's small, breaking, that's, all sorts. that's what's called, that you need something that's small that you can thread through, that yeah. you feel comfortable with the size with and so on. And I think the Cayman is probably a really good sweet spot. Now, I'm completely theorizing because I've never driven a Cayman. Mate, have the keys. <laughs> Thank like, you. Go no, for it. I probably will take you up on that. Yeah. But, um, but I, I'm theorizing here. But to me, just looking dimensionally at the size of the thing, I think that's probably where the sweet spot is. Yeah. I don't want something that's turbocharged in the Alps. Right. You don't want, you don't want the lag. And if I want lag, I want proper lag. Yeah, you want you know, eight is the, like nothing, 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 massive amount. Well, that's it. to me, that's the point of having a turbo. Yeah. Otherwise, you might as well go NA. If it's to if yeah. it's for it to feel like it's not a turbo, then there's no point. Yeah. Um, I mean, each to their own. But you know, anyway, I'm, when I'm you're totally in the mountains, when you're in the mountains, you don't you don't really want lag of any kind. Yeah. Really. Um, well, I don't anyway. And uh, yeah, I think I think a Cayman with an NA engine and a manual gearbox up in the mountains would be lovely. Mm. Yeah, I think that'd be a good one. But I think, I think what, what, what turns me on really when it comes to cars isn't, like for me, it's got to put a grin on my face. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to meeting other people and seeing other cars, mm. I don't really care what the car is. Yeah. It doesn't matter to me whether it's a Citroen Saxo or a 959 or everything else in between. Mm. What interests me is kind of the stories behind the car and yeah. the people yeah. and the journeys they've been on. Like a box fresh car that's rolled off the showroom is boring. It's not of interest to me. Yeah. Whereas a car that someone's poured their heart and soul into, it's like when you pulled up with your car, that's really interesting to me. Cool. Because it's a car that you've made your own, you've done your modifications to, there are stories you can tell me, there are adventures you've been on, hopefully. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You know, what's it called? And and th that's a much more interesting proposition than a car that I can get the stats off off the internet. Oh, totally. well, that car does 500 horsepower. I can read that off a brochure. Yeah, yeah, Whereas yeah. I can't read about your car, you know, off a brochure. I need to meet you. I need to have a conversation with you. And I'm, yeah. I'm, I get a buzz out of, out of um, feeding off of other people's enthusiasm um, for their cars and the adventures they've been on. 100%. And I mean, uh, you know, I think... Again, within, I think, five minutes of talking, we got onto this and exactly the same. It, it is, apart from the engineering, the nonprofit side of this, going out and meeting people and sharing those experiences and listening to their kind of history as to where they got to, because everybody's got something that drove them to where they are within this kind of mm. arena. And, and especially turning it from, you know, something that's just an in, being an enthusiast to being a job and like commercializing it in some way. That's, that isn't by accident most of the time. There's somebody's made a life choice, mm. especially in those early days where something is, is an idea. It hasn't, it's, it's going to falter. It's going to do well. It's going to kind of judder its way along. I, uh, and those people I find absolutely fascinating because you're living and breathing. You're not just kind of dipping your toe in, you know, an accountant on, you know, during the week and then you'll jump in your kind of 
140 grand GT3 and drive it to an event to show off and stand next to it for, and no disrespect to those guys that do that, that's just not someone I connect with. Mm -hmm. The stories I want to hear about are the people like yourself where you've gone like, no, no, I need to bury myself in this stuff up to the neck. Yeah, it's, it's like I said, it's about the people, water cooled, air cooled, and everything else in between, I don't really care. What interests me is the person and that car. What, yeah. you know, what's been done to that car. Yeah, I like modifications. I think you know, cars are mass produced for a mass market, uh -huh. which is fair enough. You know, they've got to appease shareholders and all the rest of it. Totally fine, I'm a capitalist. But the reality is that we're all individuals with individual requirements. And so a car that's mass produced isn't necessarily going to appeal to the individual, especially yeah. if you're an enthusiast. Yeah. So if you can make something your own, you can take something and, and, and make it your own and make it the truest representation of what driving means to you, then awesome. Yeah. And that's the kind of cars I get under my skin. Yeah. So I'm, I'm lucky enough to have a few cars and the, the low mileage rare stuff doesn't really, isn't the stuff I'll remember, mm -hmm. you know, in years to come. I won't, my memories won't be of it gathering dust in the corner of a workshop. That's not yeah. really what interests me. Yeah. What interests me is the, the high mileage car that's not rare, but I've been able to pour my heart and soul into, mm -hmm. really, really make it my own, make it something that best represents what driving means to me as yeah. an individual, not as a mass, uh, not, as a, not as a company selling as many cars as possible. And that I've made the most memories with, you know, that I've taken on an Alpine tour or this, that, the other. I look down there and I can see, um, I look at a car and I see, okay, that's me and Biscuit, my mini Schnauzer, and full of luggage and the air conditioning broke in Bologna in 45 degrees of heat with my wife swearing at me and then us, you know, what's called having an argument about it, but then 10 minutes later laughing about how stupid the situation was. Yeah. And that was a memory and that was a laugh and that was great. And that's the type of stuff I take to the grave with me. Yeah. Not the memories of a car that's got no mileage and is sat in the corner of a workshop. Yeah. yeah. You know, so... So yeah, each to their own. I'm not here to judge. We all have to have an opinion, especially in this, in this day and age on everything all the time. But sometimes I don't think we necessarily need to. And um, I don't think I'm not here to judge anyone else. Either, right? No, I'm you not know? here to judge anyone else. You know, everybody uses cars in different ways. So yeah. I think that's fantastic. There's, the world's big enough for everyone. But, but me personally, um, yeah, I just want to drive to the moon and back <laughs> <laughs> perpetually. Yeah. Why not? So, so again, trying to follow that thread through, right? So. Um, where did where did this? I mean, the detail. Like you're you're clearly heavily into design, incredibly detail focused. I'm I'm genuine genuinely fascinated. How how did this what we're sitting in now happen? How did that happen? So in 2015, I sold my business. Yeah, it was a home wine electronics business. Um, nothing that I was really fascinated about. But I think that for me, the interest in that business was doing business as opposed to the subject matter. Yeah. Then I messed around for a couple of years trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. Had a couple of failures, um, a couple of non-starters. And then slowly, bit by bit, the idea for this started formulating. So I, I've been a Porsche enthusiast for, for, a, for a while now. And, and, and through my own cars, I met awesome industry professionals where there was modifications I was doing this and the other where I mm. needed help on the cars. Um, and also brilliant enthusiasts, um, you know, what's called and, and, uh, and, and, and just enjoyed that environment. And I wanted to create something little by little, the idea started formulating to create something where I could unite everyone in one place. Yeah, yeah. So th this place is a glorified business park effectively. Mm -hmm. um, yes, the nuts and bolts of it is this 100 acre rural estate with lakes and woodland and all that stuff and, you know, some nice buildings on site but essentially we're that's all that we are you know we're we're a business park and mm. the the idea is about bringing people together so we're a house and it's the people that make it home so so yeah so slowly bit by bit the idea of boxing gas started formulating this idea of bringing people together and so we had to look for a place that had the right amount of land the right amount of buildings and also be in the right location and quite a few people told us that we were completely mad and we weren't going to find something that would fit all those yeah. criteria because yeah. it is looking for a needle in a haystack in some regards massively and, uh, and actually we were on this, this road trip in Italy with my wife and we put an offer in on a place subject to getting planning for it up the road in Adbury and it fell through and I threw my toys out the pram. You know, we've been looking for quite a while at that point and I just said to Emma, you know, everyone's right. We're, we're, we're never going to find something that's going to take years before mm. we find something. And Emma was like, Emma's always the, um, I don't know, she's my, uh, she's my compass really. She keeps me on the straight and narrow. <laughs> And uh, she said, uh, listen, let's just go back to the hotel room. Let's just start looking again. And I'm sure, you know, what's cool. Let's just, 
let's just finish let's just finish our dinner and let's just go back and just start looking I cool. was like, okay fine you know so she's there looking away you know on, online and everything and i'm just sitting there you know feeling down at the dumps feeling yeah, sorry yeah. for myself um like a right tool and uh and suddenly she says i found something <laughs> And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. She goes, yeah, yeah, it fits all the criteria. I was like, yeah, go on, let's have a look. So we ha I have a look on the laptop, and I'm like, Jesus, it's got, it's got everything that we need. It's got mm. the right amount of land, it's got the right building, it's the right location. So we, we flew back the next day. Uh, no, we drove back the next day, sorry. And, uh, and, um, and then we, we visited the place a couple of days later, and indeed it, fit all, it had all the right criteria for what we were trying to do. So we um, made an offer, subject to planning, the planning went through, and... Um, Six years later, here we are sitting with you. Wild. And the car, so the cars, where um, I'm guessing you were, did you have as many as you got now, or was it, were you still yeah, all over the place? And so they, there, was, there was a friend of mine um, who ran a, a seatbelt business, Quick Fit. Um, huh, I'm going to go company. and see them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they can do your car. Yeah, yeah. Great guy. Um, and uh, I've known Stuart for years, and he's just, he's a very passionate guy. He's very talented at what he does. Mm. And anyway, he had a bit of, he had in his workshop, he had a bit of spare space. So I stored a few cars there, I stored right. a few cars here, there, and I used to live in London, in central London. So mm. they, were, they were spread about all over the place. Um, and also at the time I, I was running a business, you know, that wasn't, that was kind of, I was a middleman. Um, in effect, that's kind of what I still am today. Right. You know, I was a middleman. Um, so there was no reason for me to have any kind of presence or for the business to have any kind of presence. Right. Whereas when the idea for this started formulating, um, we needed to get it out there. We needed to people to discover what we were doing. Yeah. And so it was so so it was it was a calculated way to 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 make sure that we we're on people's radar. I mean, to give you an idea, that the marketing strategy was quite aggressive actually. So we created a a Facebook group um, for Porsche owners in the UK. Mm -hmm. and industry professionals mm. and the idea was to create the marketplace before you'd figure out exactly what the product was going to be um, as opposed to doing it the other way around so i added every single person that i knew within the poor circles yeah yeah and then kept pushing people into that group into that group into the group to the point it became to twenty thousand members wow. and they're all highly highly vetted so you you we had to there were a couple of friends who helped me out mm. i couldn't do it on my own and uh we had to you know check that they were living in england yeah. check that they were genuine porsche owners and this yeah. and the other and that yeah. way it was really uh, a curated audience and we knew that we had a really a really um undiluted and pure database yeah there. yeah then um, by that point, the, the, the idea for this had already started formulating. And then the idea was, okay, right. So now I've got my marketplace to market to. I need to put in within this group um, every single owner of all the poor specialists around the country into one place. So that when I'm building this place, they're constantly getting updates on a regular basis mm. without me having to knock on their door. Mm. Um, so I'm not selling double glazing. So it's just an easier way to do it, you know. It's in their subconscious. It pops up in their newsfeed. It's constantly suffocating them with, with pictures of this building of this going up, um, without having to without having to do a cold call. Which so that's is, what I again, did. that's crazy because I mean, again, I'm trying to build something without. I'm not a marketeer. I'm not a business owner. I've never. I'm a bog standard employee of a company. So I'm low skilled, high enthusiasm, and it's interesting to hear your take on that was is kind of the opposite I, I almost feel like apologizing to everybody as i go i'm like I, i'm just learning here and, and actually your confidence levels going into that and kind of and uh, you, you no, use the word aggressive I, right and i don't think you meant it in as a negative aggressive it's like really push like push yeah. push push no i think i think i'm i'm pretty relentless yeah once i tell. get into an idea in my head then it's just go ravenous right. now that doesn't mean that i don't doubt myself so when you say confidence that's not the word for it really? relentless is one thing right okay. but confidence is another is is another because i doubt myself definitely. yeah okay there are times when i had huge doubts you know and there are still times when i doubt myself massively mm. with what, what's coming up as well there's no guarantees in life no you know no. you take risks and either you succeed or you don't yeah and you put yourself out there but I think it doesn't matter whether you succeed or you don't. The fact of the matter is that you tried. Yeah. The yeah. fact of the matter is I can go to sleep at night saying I gave it my all. Yeah. And if I failed, it doesn't matter because it was all about the fact that I gave it a push. Yeah. Other people might not see it that way. Yeah, yeah. You know, what's called other people are taught about success. But actually, I don't think it's about that. I think it's about putting in the best that you possibly can. Mm. And then if it sticks, it sticks. I think, I think there's, there's another element, though. And I think it com coming back to design and kind of branding and stuff. 
it's part, I mean, there's lots of Porsche events out there. There's lots mm. of people doing events. Some are great and they're really attractive and they're kind of like, oh, that looks cool. Others are a bit more benign. And again, no disrespect to anyone because everyone's enthusiastic, but I think that's what set uh, oil cool at the time. And now Megaphonics, like for me, it was, it was the, the feel, the kind of aesthetic, the overall brand. It just, it felt really, I don't know, like even having, um, it looks like it's polished concrete on the wall and things like that. It just it, the, the attention to detail, like I was saying before, I'm a detail guy. So for me, I was immediately attracted to all of this. It looked like nothing was an accident. And I don't think it is. There's like little discs on, on there's like a Rolling Stones book on the tape. Like it looks like you've gone around and gone, that book is two inches to the left. <laughs> yeah, I drive my wife mad. Is that a thing though? Is that pretty much yeah, accurate? I think I, think I am. I am. I, I am definitely obsessive, yeah. but like all of us, you know, when, when we're enthusiasts and when you're passionate about something, you, you, you're going to be obsessive about things. Yeah. I think, you know, what's called my, my wife, you know, like what's called, I'll, I'll go, I'll go through tunnel vision into something mm. and just kind of go down that rabbit hole. Like I'll, she, she says that I do that with music all the time. Right. Okay. Like at the end of the day, like I'm a blues guy, I'm a rock guy through and through, yeah. but that doesn't mean I don't appreciate other things. So sometimes I'll go tunnel vision. I'll be into like Ibiza, you know, classic. Um, experimental beach club style chill out music, you know, yeah. and I will dive into that to no end, you know, until the point where my wife goes, oh, Jesus Christ, you can we just listen to something, something else, else for, for a minute or two? <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, no, I'm, I've, got, I've got a bit of a, I've got a bit of an obsessive personality yeah. trait, definitely, and I, I just, I don't, I don't know, I think it's, I think that without wanting to sound grandiose, and this is probably going to sound awful, but I think all of us as individuals have been given have been born with a certain set of tools, mm. a certain capability. And it's up to us as individuals to kind of maximize what we've been given, mm -hmm. I think. Um, so I, I think that's kind of maybe... For you, is that a linear thing? Because for me, it's not. It's like, it's fully logarithmic. So I have stumbled my way through and I feel like I'm now gaining confidence, self-confidence to kind of put myself out there a little bit more as I was talking before about, you know, filming myself and things like that and it the, this it's it's growing but it's now it's kind of it feels like it's lifting mm -hmm. like even sitting down and having this conversation with you three or four years ago a i'd have struggled with that it's somebody new i would probably get a bit of social anxiety and then but yeah this feels like we've been doing this for decades for me oh, yeah, anyway totally. it feels like we've been doing it for a long time so no, i totally agree with you i mean like what's called i remember doing 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 an interview however many years ago it was and I remember just being so anxious and yeah. so worried about this and the other. Like I said, like my previous business, the whole thing is I was a submarine, you know, nobody, yeah, yeah. nobody would see me coming. I'd be, you know, nice and underneath. I wouldn't be dealing with the end user. Mm. Um, you know, what's called, I was literally putting together um, manufacturers and, and retailers together. So I never had to put, put my head up against the precipice. You yeah. couldn't find me. Yeah. Um, whereas with this business, you know, what's called by nature of trying to attract an audience and trying to attract clients, mm. I've had to put my head above the precipice yeah, a yeah. lot. And it was certainly something I wasn't very comfortable with and I felt very awkward and strange. Mm. Whereas now I'm starting to feel a bit more, a bit more, a bit more relaxed yeah. about it. And funnily enough, the more you relax and the more you're yourself, <laughs> the easier it becomes. It more. And it's so stupid, but it's so obvious, but it's so true. I mean, like, I, d I don't know, it's taken me a little while, but I, like you, I think like anyone, you know, what's called, it takes time for us to feel comfortable yeah. sometimes in our own skin. Um, and even to the extent, because I think the internet and social media can be so judgmental, me coming into this and loving Porsche but not being an encyclopedia, mm. really worried about you know, me saying something and someone will go, well, that's wrong. And, and it's funny that I, what I've done is I've lent into it and be like, openly say, I, yeah. I, I, I am like right at the beginning of my journey of properly learning, not just kind of going, oh, well, that's a, even just identifying what a 928 looks like or what a 914 looks like. I can kind of do that, mm. but everything else, be like knowing that, a, I don't know what you said, whether it's an 89 or a 90 is a C4 only, it doesn't come in a two. Mm. These are the things that they just, that, that stuff, you kind of build that knowledge out. Well, yeah, exactly. But just I lean mean, into it, you know, I'm not gonna, I, whereas and before I think I would have tried to, I have to be a certain way because that's what public would expect from mm. somebody that's gonna talk about Porsche. Whereas now I'm like, no, nope. <laughs> I'm, no, I, I'm I, learning. I, I'm enthusiastic. Any, anybody, that's going to, anybody that's going to criticise someone for not having the, the knowledge on, on, on a specific subject, it's not worth the time. I, I, 
we don't have time for that. I mean, like no. with, with megaphonics specifically, like I like to think of it as like as, as very inclusive. For me, fundamentally, Porsche is an inclusive brand. Yeah. Like you, you can get everything from a three grand Boxster, which is a phenomenal car. Amazing, yeah. You know, um, and a huge amounts of car for the money, mm -hmm. all the way up to a multi-million pound collector Porsche. But the fact of, and, and, and that's awesome, because you get people from all different walks of yeah. life, yeah. Um, with all different, uh, it's such a broad church. So whereas like Ferraris, Lamborghinis, something like that, you know, they're five figures minimum to get into them. Yeah. So there's a certain demographic there. And so, so because, Porsche is available to everyone, relatively speaking, from three grand all the way up to a multi-million pound collector yeah. car. It's not an exclusive brand, it's an inclusive brand. And I think that's what I kind of wanted Megaphonics to be about. Yes, okay, it's an air-cooled event, in inverted commas, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but fundamentally, I don't think we're snobby in any way, shape or form I didn't at find all. That. You know, like there's, 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 there's room for everyone, and what's interesting to me is the enthusiasm more than there is everything else. Mm. And later down the line, when I have more time and when we finish the buildings, and that also gives us the infrastructure um, for f to be able to do more. Um, we'll do lots more events, not just about the air cooled stuff. Mm -hmm. We'll do water cooled stuff, um, transaxle stuff. I and mean, there's so much awesome stuff in the Porsche, yeah. in the Porsche world. And then we'll go further than that because I think, yes, we're all Porsche guys, but we're all car guys. We're mm. all mechanical guys. We're all into design. We're all into clothes. All these different things. Mm. And you look at Megaphonics, and yes, it's a Porsche event, but fundamentally we get jewelry guys. Yeah. You know, where there's jewelry brands there. There's Reno, who's also a Porsche guy. You get um, Deus, who were sponsoring um, a couple of years ago, and uh, and Carby is a is a Porsche guy. Um, you know, what's called. We all have different interests, but funnily enough, those those interests tend to be relatively similar. Yeah. So yeah, and so what I'm trying to say is is that with Megaphonics, we harbor more than just the Porsche interest in our demographic, yeah, yeah. whether it's uh, glasses, fashion, jewelry, whatever it may well be, uh, cafe racer, motorcycles, and all the rest of it. Yeah. And I think that Boxing Gas as a brand has got to recognize that. Yeah. And I think, I think that, that, that Porsche that needs off. to empower us. It doesn't need to restrict yes. us. Yeah. And it's, it will always be the, our core and in our DNA. But fundamentally, we're more than just Porsche as enthusiasts. Mm. Um, and I think it's important that our brand represents that. Now, it'll always be very highly curated. Mm. We'll always highly curate the things that really get under our skin and that our demographic are into. Mm. But um, we certainly won't let Porsche restrict us. We'll make that empower us and we'll do things which are non-Porsche yeah. as well. Talking about we, how much of it is your vision and how much of it is shared with Auto Farm and your partner and your friends and other people that you know that you're sort of networking is it, it feels like it that, that you, in the same way you're talking about my Cayman and like oh man you've, you've already got like you can see what the end looks like mm. is, is, is that the same for you with this, this whole kind of situation yeah, you, can, you can visualize what the future looks like and yeah definitely 100 yeah. percent. so the so in, in my previous business I was uh, my business partner was my cousin Right. And um, we were together always, and we'd have great days, we'd have bad days. Some days I'd hate him, other days mm. I'd love him. Mm. But either way, we were together, you know, and that was awesome. We'd always play ping pong in inverted commas mm. um, as a way to ping pong. I'm, I'm using that as a metaphor for, um, for bouncing ideas back and forth, yeah. for yeah. having someone to an echo chamber, or also not an echo chamber, but having someone to, to share ideas with, to, to brainstorm with. And in some ways, that's awesome. In some ways, that's restrictive, mm. especially when you start having investors and you mm. know board meetings and all sorts of boring stuff um, that can that can that can crush your creativity. Yeah. Um, whereas with this business, I'm doing it fully on my own. You know, right, I don't have investors. Right. I don't have a business partner. It is it is purely my vision. Yeah. So it means that it's awesome because it I I'm I'm free to do exactly what I want yeah. and make it absolutely authentic to what I believe in. Yeah, yeah. But it also means that it's absolutely fucking terrifying. Because if I fail, I fail, you know, massively. And the responsibilities are purely on my shoulders. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's, there's, something, there's something you said a minute ago that, because it, engineering is a similar situation, right? So it's my baby, I've now, slowly but created in my head what I think it would look like at the end mm. and I'm very slow very slowly trying to chase it because it's not my day job and, I, and I'm conscious so I so I podcast every week right and then last week we had we lost one of our dogs we, got th we had three dogs and we I'm lost sorry one. to hear that that's awful yeah it sucks yeah, it's tough. Um, and I didn't put anything out and I so, so my social media efforts kind of dipped a little bit 
And I went and I recorded one that was like a, an apology almost, like for sorry I didn't put anything out. And I, and I re-recorded one as like the opposite. I'm making no apologies, mm. absolutely none whatsoever. Everybody really, I'd love to see this as people move away from that kind of feeling of having to commit to the, this stuff, right? Mm. But I think what the, my point was is that you were talking about this being on your shoulders and it just being you and what happens if it fails. But then earlier on, we were talking about like failure is a part of this journey and, you mm. know, and I guess the bit, the bit that, because I, I was thinking about, well, what if engineering fails? It's going to feel pretty rough, right? Because mm. I've got this vision, I want to achieve it. But also I'm trying to live in that space of, I don't, I don't want to focus on the success or failure of something. I just want to be more present. And, yeah, and I think it's, it's, that, I think it's that's, hard that's to a do. universal problem yeah. nowadays, especially in the Western world where we're, we're definitely not present enough for sure definitely i think you know we could all do with taking a step back and actually looking at how far we've all come as individuals mm. you know what's what if i told you where if i told you 10 years ago where you'd be today i'm sure you'd be pretty happy with yourself if you told me f i think probably five years ago so what was i doing five years ago i was i was working a pr pretty nasty health issue i was in a job that that was hard but it, it was growth for me um i just left the military I just this. I didn't have a Porsche. I had a, a half-built Lotus Elise that was still in bits mm. that I felt pretty down about because I'd not really completed it. And I had this date, that I had an arbitrary date. We always do that, or I've done that. I give myself a date where something should be done by. So all of it felt a bit like all over the place. So yeah, no question. Even five years ago, ten years ago, definitely this would have seemed like a pipe dream. Five yeah. years ago, this would have seemed like that. Wouldn't that be lovely? But I don't know. We'll wait and see. And then here I am, sat with you. It just. And which makes me think again, like success or failure, irrelevant. I don't know what's going to happen in five effort. more it's, years, it's right? It's the effort that you put in. It doesn't matter whether you succeed or whether you fail. The fact of the matter is you gave it your all. 100%. That's all that matters. Yeah. You know, what's it called? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's too easy to sit on the sidelines watching, you know, what's called and criticizing. And actually, it doesn't really matter. The fact of the matter is, is you put in the effort. And that's, that's what keeps me going. You know, yeah. like what's called, I've, had, I've had moments when I've had serious doubts. Yeah, serious doubts about this and the other but for some reason or another for some reason my wife has always had this relentless belief in me and that's what's empowered me to keep going that's, that's so what's good, empowered me to to, yeah. to just really just be relentless about it yeah but um no she she's been she's been absolutely amazing i couldn't i couldn't i fundamentally couldn't do it without her 100 percent. you know and and she's been through it because the thing is is like you know when you when you're in a relationship as anybody who's in a relationship will tell you, when one of you goes through something, the other one goes through it as well. Absolutely. You know, yeah. and, and this, this project had a huge amount of challenges and mm. huge amounts of problems to overcome um, that I really won't bore you with. Um, but, and so, so, so Emma went through it as well. Yeah. 100%. Um, she went through it as well. So it was, it was, it was tough on her as well. But... Um, yeah, it's all but, worthwhile. But drawing it all the way back to something we both said, it's probably a nice finish actually before we do a little bit of a quick tour around. But again, off camera, within a few minutes of meeting, we both sort of said, you know, come, if some, that whole kind of like, if you really got to take a bit of perspective on where you are and how fortunate mm. you are. And I mean, you as in the royal you. But, and it's true, right? Is It's like those, those, Oh, it sounds like such a cliche, all that hard stuff kind of... It is a cliche, but... It but, but it's a true cliche, isn't it? Like that you... Yeah. Those things that you go through them and they're difficult and they're... At the time, they feel like the end of the world and then you kind but of listen, move past it. Day, at the end of the day, you know, we're called, we've all got to get perspective and like the, the reality is that everything is bullshit apart from the fact that you need a roof over your head and food yeah. on your plate. Yeah. You have those, that's the fundamentals. Yeah. Everything else afterwards is just surplus. You know what's called, and 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 Emma reminds me of that. She goes like, if if it all fails and it all cocks up and it all goes to shit, yeah. it doesn't fucking matter. We have each other. Yeah, we'll have a roof over our heads and we'll have food on the table. And it, you know, that's that's all that matters. That's all that matters. That is all that matters, guys. You yeah. know, like it, I, it's it, it's it sounds like a bit of a Disney ending, really. But <laughs> it, I mean, yeah. it does. But it, but let's face it, these things are the truth, aren't they? It, you know? it is the truth. It is. The you truth. know, everything else is the, the the sort of tinsel on the tree, but. Yeah. yeah, Frank. Thank you so much. The, I, you know, th this genuinely could have been, you know, a mate down a pub, sat there chewing the fat for an hour, and and I've loved every minute of it. Good. I mean well, thanks so. for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, 
Yeah, it's fundamentally, it's always a pleasure to meet another enthusiast. You yeah. Know? And uh, as soon as you pulled up in your car, I was like, mm, I think I'm going to get along fine with this person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so we started cool. talking about it. There was uh, there was connection there, and it's 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 funny that, isn't it? How how you can bond with someone that you've never met before if you guys have an interest in common. Yeah. Uh, and uh, your car represents you and, and speaks volumes. So it, it was, it, it almost was obvious that actually it was going to be a good chat, I think. Cool. Well, thanks <laughs> yeah. so much. Let's uh, do, yeah. if, um, if it's all right, we'll do a quick wander around and you can point out your favorites and I'll get some panning shots of that kind of um, the green car with road rash all over it if it's here and yeah, sure. yeah a, bit, a few bits and pieces of that. Sounds good. So walk me through, is everything in here yours or is it? Guilty. Wow. So this is, this is what, I don't know, um, I'm gonna say 15 years of, of buying, selling, yeah, as I go as, a, as an enthusiast. So there's, there's, you have to remember that all those years ago, these cars were not, certainly not as desirable as No. Um, Magnus Walker said the same thing. If he's had to start getting that, he couldn't. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and um, and yeah, so it's it's been it's been a little while. So this is a uh, this is in the works or yeah. So this is this is the oh, is this the one you're on about? Yeah, this is the other ST. So the <laughs> so the uh, we were as a group of us we were in um, we were in. Uh, we were staying down at Folkestone the night before. Yeah. And then the next day we were getting up early to get on the train to get going. And this car has a very, it has a very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It has a, um, a starting procedure that's quite peculiar, like a lot of these cars. And yeah. Single seat, that's the right word. And, uh, and, um, and because the other cars had started before mine, I couldn't really hear it. So I wasn't really quite listening and quite catching it quite right. Anyway, I ended up flooding the fucking engine. Uh, okay. and, um, and I couldn't get it going, couldn't get it going, couldn't get it going. Eventually I said to her, listen guys, you got everything on the sat navs, just go ahead, yeah. I'll catch up with you. Yeah. What's called, I'll call it the RAC guy. So, and the, one of the guys left me a jump start pack. So I started trying to jump start the car. And the car, the car just won't go, won't go, won't go, won't go. And eventually, um, or the RAC guy, and the RAC guy's on the way. So, in the meantime, my infinite wisdom, I go to wind down the passenger window, mm. and um, and the, the glass falls straight into the door. Oh. Lucky it didn't smash, but it yeah. falls straight into the door. Um, so I get the spanners out, and I start taking the whole thing apart, and I've got grease in my hair, and like my beard, and my face, and everything's all over the place. And uh, this is in the car park of the of the of the uh, of the hotel, and. Um, Eventually, I managed to wind it all the way up, but then I need something to hold it up, like a piece of wood or something. Yeah. And I spot in the corner of my skip, so I jump into the skip, and I'm jumping <laughs> up and down on this pallet that I found to snap off a piece of wood. Right. All the hotel guests are waking up, and I look like a mad homeless person. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and uh, just as I'm getting out of the skip, the RAC man arrives, so he's 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 thinking, what the fuck's going on as well? And um, and then uh, so I fix the window, duct tape it, you know, the best I can, and and lodge a piece of wood. And then the RAC guy starts trying to start the car as well with his jumper, pa jumper pack. We're using car cleaner and it's almost going, it's almost going, it's just not having it. Right. And eventually his jump pack completely dies. So he says, okay, well, we're going to have to tow it back. And I'm like, fuck, okay, well, let's just try one more time with my friend's small jump pack. Yeah. We'll try one more time the car started. And then I did the journey. I, so, so, because I had a similar situation, I had a core pack die on the ring, coming back down the straight as if I was going to head to the car park. Um, and try get, and it was a K-series at the time, trying to get in a K-series coil pack um, in Germany. Nope. And I was, everyone else was like, guys, we, we've got to go, we can't hang around for you. And um, I dealt with it really badly. <laughs> I was a miserable, angry, small person this is the, at that this point. Is the, this is the thing, like, what's it called? You know, I, I love old cars, but at the same time, sometimes, like, when all this shit kicks off, and I've had it, I had once, what was it? I can't remember what it was, one car caught fire, the other car, like the really? gearbox blew up. Something else happened to another car in the space of like a month. And at that point, I was just like, you know what? I'm just, I just want to sell everything or set everything on fire. Right. And then just what's called, and then just go and buy myself a brand new 911 with a fucking warranty that lasts three years. You know, just stop this shit. So I, you, I you am glad. Keeping old cars on the road yeah. is a fucking challenge. It, yeah, it's it difficult. is difficult. And it's, it's really rewarding when it all works. But when it doesn't work, it yeah. is really frustrating. Yeah. But it's part of the journey and it makes it, it, makes it worthwhile. When everything does come together. For sure. When, the, when all the ingredients are just right, 
you know, the road is dry, yeah. the sun is out, yeah. it's clear, there's no one around. The sun's the, just the setting. The oil's just at the right temperature. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's glorious. But the rest of the time, it can be very frustrating. <laughs> So what is, what is the spec of this car then? So this car started off life as a 69 long wheelbase and then it was built to ST specifications, so it's got ST steel arches um, okay. and then it's running a 3 litre MFI, um, basically RSR engine um, that we've dropped out. There's, 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 um, there's a known fault on the engine cases of these where um, there's like what looks like a hole but isn't a hole and the way to do it properly is to weld it up with a chemical and the person, for some reason, at some point or another, someone's done it with a piece of silicone. So uh, it's not really the proper okay. way. So we dropped the engine to be able to do that and to yeah. give the engine a proper, really good service. Yeah. Um, the calipers need rebuilding as well. And so the calipers, uh, they're, what are the calipers from? They're not the front caliper. The, the, so the front are turbo <laughs> items, and I think okay. the rear ones are from a Boxster, actually. Oh, uh, okay. From cool. memory. Yeah, I can't yeah. remember. It's terrible, but yeah. Um, so there's, there's, there's a real mismatch. But it's, the point is, is that it got me back, but it was hanging on for dear life. Because I mean, even the front right caliper was just, the pistons were just starting to stick. Right, okay. And you know, when you're bounding to a fucking head at a very reasonable speed, yeah. in inverted commas, yeah. you know, the last thing you want when you've got a cliff edge is for something to bind up properly. So it was, it was a little bit nerve wracking. <laughs> yeah. And this is the, so, I mean, is this a favourite or is that is it a stretch to so, say you have a favourite? Um, the favourite is a car that is actually called Black Daddy that's been off the road for seven years now, so you wouldn't okay. know it. Right. Because um, the concept, the theory is it's Black Betty and company, so and yeah. company's the other cars and Black Betty is Oh, uh, okay, that makes sense. But that, that car's been off the road for seven years and it was just it was just the name of that car in a forum handle name before social media people. Um, and that car's my favourite because it's the one I've driven the most and the one I've modified the most. Right. It's so nothing, nothing rare or low mileage. If anything, it's the opposite. Really? Yeah. And so where, out of interest then, if that's the favourite, how come it's not in here being worked on? Because it is being worked on. The engine's over here. Okay. Um, you'll like this one, engine is like And I'm rebuilding it again. Right, so okay. it's for the third time, the third iteration. And then the, the body work, the metal works, um, all being done and completed. So uh, this is a, a 3.8 litre engine. Hotel cased, forged rods, um, 3.8 litre Marlow barrels and pistons, titanium springs and retainers, high lift cams, uh, bought and polished heads, um, and then a, a slightly lower compression to 10.1. Okay. These intake panels we made ourselves for this, so they're made of uh, pieces of solid billet. Okay. Same with the bracketry here, and then this is not an air conditioning unit, this is actually Ooh. a centrifugal supercharger. Okay. It is a centrifugal unit. Yeah, and then the intercooler goes over, like, over the top. And so it goes back when to you, what when I was... When you say slightly low compression, I was like, there's forced induction coming. Yeah. Yeah. So th this, uh, this, is the, this is the conversation we were having earlier. So like a lot of times with Porsches, or a lot of times with cars, when the people start modifying cars, they don't have a clear path of what exactly they're trying to achieve, yeah. or exactly how they're going to use the car. Yeah. And the car ends up being compromised in one shape or form. So yeah. Yeah. when it came to Black Betty, when it came to that car, you know, my favorite car, I wanted to have a very clear idea of what is the car going to do, and then I can formulate exactly how I'm going to modify it. So, as we were saying earlier, my favourite thing to do is Alpine passes. So the car, every little aspect of the car, down to, from the wheels all the way up to the roof, and everything else in between, is fully designed to be good at Alpine passes. Nice. So the ratios in the gearbox, you know, the, the fact that the wheels, there are, it's my own design, and they have um, stainless dishes, which are much, much stronger than the aluminium ones. You know, just all sorts of little details and think bits and pieces to make it. To make exactly it what you want. And funnily enough, mate, the, um, the, the tagline for engineering is design for purpose. Mm -hmm. Same principle, right? Mm -hmm. Pick something that that is going to do and mm -hmm. then design everything around it. Don't kind of make it a... I don't master want, of none. Yeah, master of none. That bothers me. And, and again, that's partly why you get the, you know, new cars are fine but they're designed to be a master of none. They're designed to just do a broad mm. spread of everything. Mm. And that's, that's just not what I'm about. I mm. would rather pick Alpine passes and kind of go, right, that's, you know. In it, engineering it affects terms. everything. It affects everything. It's like, for example, if you're going to build a track car, you're going to use maybe Cup 2s, you know, tyres. Yeah. Whereas if you're going to do Alpine passes, a Michelin Pilot Sport Correct. Contact 5 or whatever it is, yeah, Michelin yeah. Pilot Sport 5 is probably the one that you want. Yeah. So like, the purpose is so important. The settings on the suspension, the, the brakes, the weight of the car, the interior trim, the, you know, 
all those bits and pieces can be affected by exactly um, by defining exactly how you're going to use the car.